Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, How a Semantic Layer Makes Data Mesh Work at Scale, sponsored today by At Scale. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them by the Q&A, or if you like to tweet, or we encourage you to share highlights via your favorite social media platform using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, Zoom defaults the chat to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change it to network with everyone. To find the Q&A or the chat panels, you may click on those icons found in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Ailev Tutuk. Uh, Ailev is the global head of product for AtScale. Her most recent role prior to AtScale was was as Click's Vice President of Innovation and Design, overseeing a global team of user experience designers, product designers, and engineers. Her innovations have led to patents for search and conversational analytics, data analysis, data management, and more. Her research and technology development for augmented intelligence, a combination of data science and AI, has led to the rise of third generation analytics. Aleph is also a founding member of the Innovation Forum at Forum Ventures, a leading venture group investing in early stage software as a service startups. In this role, she serves as an advisor and mentor to, co to founders and executives. She recently won the Women in Tech Outstanding Leadership Award in recognition of her outstanding leadership contributions to the cloud industry. She was also named a winner of the Business Intelligence Group's Artificial Intelligence Excellence Awards Program, acknowledging her work leading the charge to blend AI into analytics to further the AI-human interaction with data while striving to eliminate bias. Very impressive bio. And with that, I will give the floor to Ayla to start today's webinar. Hello and welcome. Thank you very much, Shannon. Uh, it is great to have the chance to be uh, with the audience and together with you to talk about uh, data mesh and how a semantic layer makes data mesh work at its scale. Uh, so um, I would like to start, first of all, that data mesh is still a relatively new concept. While uh, I think its beginnings can be tacked back to 2019. But what I'm recently noticing is its popularity has especially grown over the past two years. So I think this is a great topic to cover uh, with this audience. Um, in fact, before joining to the session, I was curious about the Google Trends and I just did a quick analysis and uh, it actually uh, Google Trends show that around a 300% growth in search for data mesh uh, volume over the last uh, 18 months. So it's obviously there is you know, more and more interest around data mesh. Uh, and in this session, I will be talking about why I see semantic layer as an enabler, uh, enabling technology for a data mesh strategy. So with that, let's get started. So uh, I think the first thing that I would like to cover is, you know, um, is a relatively new term and concept. Um, I think there is some confusions and, you know, maybe it's sometimes hard to find a, a generally agreed upon definition of data mesh. Although I would say that in the last couple of months, there is more um, agreement on the, on the definition. And for starters, um, I think there's agreement that data mesh is different than the, you know, it's not the same with data fabric. So uh, for me, data mesh is really, it's about uh, creating an approach for organizations where they can build a decentralized analytics architecture where really um, the ownership of the data uh, is given to business domain and business uh, units uh, so that they can actually create uh, value-driven uh, data products. Um, and and I, I think that really makes sense. And I will be covering in the rest of the session like some of the challenges that we have been seeing uh, in the you know in the in the life of um, data. Um, just giving this ownership to the group um, of users who are the closest to and best understand the data and their business business needs just makes a lot of sense. And uh, for a successful data mesh, I think there are a couple things that all organizations need to pay attention. The first one is um, the technologies that you are using um, to enable data mesh, and it can be a group of um, set of different technologies. They really need to kind of need to give the flexibility and agility that is needed to be able to apply new business rules and logic um, to the data. 
The second important thing and the to enable really a data mesh is you need to make sure that there is central governance and so that you can ensure a single version of the truth while you are giving the ownership of data to business units. Um, but that central governance um, also requires a federated ownership of data uh, for the business units. And then the final thing, this is all about uh, user needs. Um, and I will be talking more about you know, data products um, that is you know, where you need to have a user-driven design thinking. Um, that really kind of requires to be able to ab ab abstract technical complexity uh, from the user um, so that they can really, you know, flexibly work with the data to be able to answer their business questions. So I think this is kind of like a recap for me uh, for the definition of uh, data mesh and then the things that I will be highlighting uh, during this presentation. So before we get into um, talking more about uh, data mesh and the application of semantic layer to enable data mesh, I just want to take a step back and really, um, you know, walk us through about like um, orient ourselves like uh, different types of data that we have been always dealing in in organizations. So. Um, when we take a step back, really, um, the world of data is divided into two spaces. Uh, the first one is the operational data. And uh, this is the data that is sitting behind the, your applications, behind our services the, or the APIs. And um, this data really reflects the current state of the business. And uh, usually, um, Operational data is where we capture um, all the transactional data. And then uh, this is where we are really optimizing the infrastructure uh, for this type of data sets for application logic. Like really, this is where we are running a bunch of um, create um, update and delete operations. So this is all about you know, how we can keep the transactional uh, view of the data. On the other hand, you know, uh, to be able to monitor the data, we all need, you know, uh, we all have business questions like business users, right? This is where we, we have the need to have analytical data. And analytical data really is to optimize that data, transform that data so that um, it, it is optimized for analytics, uh, where we can run queries, um, do ML um, analysis and ML training on the data to generate predictive and prescriptive insights. And this is where we are really transforming the shape of the operational data, transactional data to become more multidimensional. And I really would like to highlight the importance of multidimensional analysis because, um, you know, business users as humans, um, this is how our brain works, right? We don't just ask a question about a KPI, like what is the sales, but we really would like to uh, break that down by different uh, dimensions, such as uh, region, warehouses, product, customers. Um, and also the other thing about the analytical data to be able to optimize for um, analytics, um, we are really capturing um, a big amount of data uh, to be able to do historical analysis on that data and also use that uh, with the ML training to do predictions. So when we think about those like two different spaces of data, uh, the, the place that is really this whole, uh, this approach or this definitions become very fragile is the how the data flows from the operational data sources to analytical data sources. And this is where we have been doing ETL. And um, so, and then I think we have seen different trends over the last uh, 20 years in terms of how we approach ETL. So let me cover that very briefly. Uh, so when we look at the data journey and how we do the ETL, I think two decades ago, we have, you know, had all get excited about the data warehouses, which we are still excited about it, right? This is where we capture, create our data marts, start schemas to be able to provide um, analytical um, analysis like on the data. Uh, but the, you know, the journey of um, data transformations has started with, you know, extracting data and then based on the uh, business users analytical questions, um, transforming that data and then loading it to a data warehouse uh, so that the data can be accessed uh, via the BI tools um, and APIs uh, to be able to answer business question. Well, this approach, although it was very effective, uh, very quickly, it just become a bottleneck uh, because one of the main um, the challenges with this approach was, um, as you all know, uh, business questions change. And now, especially right now, given the environment that we live in is become very dynamic, there's always something new around the, you know, there's the war, war going on or uh, supply chain issues. Um, 
you know, the business questions are changing literally hourly. So when you think about, you know, how the data needs to be transformed and loaded to a data warehouse to be able to answer the business question, uh, this structure is not um, really agile and flexible enough um, to be able to reflect the business moment uh, so that uh, the data can reflect the business moment to be able to answer the question. Well, um, then, um, you know, I think, you know, in the last 10 years, especially with the uh, technologies that we are see, uh, seeing, moving the data from on-prem to cloud data search, we decided to take a different approach. And then uh, I think, you know, um, the whole concept of data lake came into place. And the idea we, uh, here is that uh, with the cloud data storage, as the storage becomes cheaper, uh, the idea was, okay, let's load all of that data out of the operational data stores and then store it in data lake. And then, um, uh, with the with the with the today's with this flexible cloud uh, environments, it really make make it possible for data to get transformed more easily. So once the data is loaded into data lake, uh, with less coordination with infrastructure teams, uh, data engineers. And by the way, you know we come up with this concept of data engineer in the last probably um, ten years. Uh, now they are able to uh, script and automate transformations. Um, uh, with tools like DBT, Airflow, or, you know, in other data warehouse automation tools, uh, and then orchestrate and automate transformations directly into their Snowflake, Databricks, or BigQuery environment. So um, this really, like, this uh, way of doing um, ELT um, really uh, created a new generation of data engineers who can then support the business requests for data sets customized for domain-specific uh, users. So, like, with this logic, you know, if the data doesn't have to be analyzed, they, they, it just sits in the data lake. But then uh, if there is a new business request to um, analyze part of this data, uh, then, as, a, as I mentioned, the data engineer can actually use uh, some of these tools to be able to transform it. So um, within this flow, still like there's a dependency to data engineers, or actually, you know, recently we also have a new persona called analytical, analytics engineers. Um, so they become a bottleneck, you know, um, in terms of like, because as the business identifies the need or opportunity for a new product, like when I say product, like a dashboard or a report, they require request the from the supporting data uh, engineers to create that data. So whether these data engineers or the analytics engineers are embedded within a business unit or operate from a centrally managed team, they still like they do their best to be able to transform, uh, translate the business request into uh, into transforms uh, to to be able to deliver you know the data that will uh, to be able to answer those uh, business questions. Um, but again, within this approach, like there's a dependency to a central um, or a you know a group of personas to be able to make those transformations on the data, so that the rest of the business user, which is usually the you know 80% of the uh, analytics consumers, can start consuming that data. I guess um, for all of those two approaches, you know, although we have been doing great progress, um, and by the way, a recent term is, you know, uh, data lake, and then uh, there is also uh, lake warehouses uh, is a new term that's coming up. Um, there's still, we are seeing low analytics adoption, and uh, still there's fraction data-driven decisions in organizations. And um, I think there is you know, mainly three reasons where we are still not able to achieve um, um, the optimum uh, data-driven decisions where the data can move as fast and transform as fast as the business is changing. Um, so the first reason uh, with all of these approaches, first of all, um, as I keep saying that uh, it is very centralized and monolithic. Like as the data goes through its journey of becoming from raw to analytics ready, um, I think there's a set of um, users who are um, kind of creating the bottleneck. The other thing that I would like to say that, you know, in every approaches in terms of uh, either you are uh, doing ETL or ELT, um, that supply chain of converting raw data into become analytics ready um, actually has involved many different types of personas like data engineers, data steward, business users, and recently, as I mentioned, the analytics engineers. So there's a lot of hands-off between those personas. And at the end, the business users are the ones 
who knows the business logic that needs to be applied to the data. And then all those requirements, you know, needs to be converted um, and then trans, uh, passed to the data engineers so that they can apply those logic uh, to data for the business users to be able to consume. So that creates a bottleneck. And the final thing that I would like to say, although there's like more tools right now, like Airtable and DBT or Airflow and DBT to transform that data, uh, still those tools, they don't provide the flexibility and agility to reflect the business moment to the data. And I really would like to highlight the importance of being able to apply the business moment to the data, uh, because this is, again, as I mentioned, we live in a very competitive dynamic environment where um, things are changing so fast. And that that change requires, you know, some of the things to be reflected to the data. Maybe there's a new data warehouse or, you know, because of the supply chain issues, uh, you know, a couple of the vendors are not available um, so that you have to reflect that same, that those uh, new logic to the data. So overall, like there's a need to be able to apply the business moment uh, to the data. So um, like when we think about all of those challenges, I think what has happened uh, in, the, in the years is there has been a lot of uh, effort and technology in innovations that we have been doing to really convert the raw data to analytics ready. Um, a common example that I give is you know, during pandemic, every organization, they had the data warehouses. We all had the data marks, right? In star schemas to be able to answer the questions, but yet, um, you know, many business users were they were they were still not able to get the questions or the answers that they needed during the pandemic because, um, again, um, to be able to get the right insights to the right re users require uh, the need to have business ready data, and so first of all, let me explain what I mean by the business ready data. Um, business ready data, like. Um, you know, you can think of the business ready data as the last mile of data transformation before uh, it's put in the hands of uh, insights and data consumers. So data engineering pipelines transforms the raw operational data from uh, transactional systems into a format that is more uh, applicable for using query logic to ask questions of data. And that is where I see the transformation of raw data uh, is happening to make it analytics ready. But then again, as I mentioned, analytics ready data uh, is not really reflecting the needed and the timely business logic and business context uh, to the data. And that is where I see the gap that is happening. Like again, there's many different personas and many technologies that we use to produce the data. But on the other hand, there's the data consumers or insights and analytics consumers. They're still not able to uh, find the data that is needed to be able to answer their business question. And I think this is because maybe we think that there's a big overlap when, we, when it comes to analytics ready data. But when I think about it, there's really less overlap uh, when it comes to business ready data. So uh, again, the business ready data is the final transformed version of the data that has the timely business logic and business context applied uh, so that you know right insights to the right user can be applied uh, to the right time. So this is something that I, you know, take it from heart. Um, um, again, just like we have been always uh, making technology innovations, um, you know, solving problems to make the raw data and analytics ready, um, you know, with data warehouse automations, change data capture, and many other technologies. But we really didn't pay enough attention on how to make analytics ready data business ready. And this is where I think you know we have a chance uh, with the semantic layer to really enable the business unit units and business owners. Uh, to create a value-based data products by using the semantic layer so that uh, the analytics ready data can become business ready. All right, so uh, why I keep saying that, you know, achieving uh, business ready data um, requires to have a semantic layer. Um, I think when you, when you think about having a business ready data that truly enables uh, the data mesh concept, again, uh, you know, data mesh concept is all about how you enable the business units and uh, uh, business owners uh, with, the, with creation of the data products, uh, there are like four criteria that you need to pay attention. Um, the first one is, you know, decomposing data around domains. Um, so when I say domain, it is usually the uh, business units or business domains. Uh, so um, just a couple of examples, like it can be, you know, uh, the different um, line of businesses that you have, like finance, human resources, operations, sales. Um, 
And uh, it's about like uh, the data mesh is really uh, distributing the ownership uh, of uh, of the data with governance to those uh, uh, business units and then creating uh, data domains. The second one is really um, you need to think about uh, serving data as a product. Um, this is a very important thing for me because I spent in my career a lot of time with design thinking and then thinking about you know doing innovations always uh, with the user in mind. Uh, so when I start talking about you know uh, creating a data product, it's all about delighting the consumer uh, of that of the data product. So and if you think about the user needs when it comes to consuming insights and analytics and data, uh, the user uh, needs to really uh, trust to the data. Like when, when it comes to consuming that data, they should, uh, first of all, um, be able to easily discover uh, what data assets are available or data products available to them. Um, and then once, you know, they search and discover the data products and they should be able to easily really understand, you know, and trust where that data come from and what type of transformations has been done to that data. And now what is the best use cases for that data? So, Again, I really would like to highlight, like if you want to achieve a successful data mesh uh, practice, you really need to approach the data as a product and then have uh, user-driven design thinking uh, on that. Uh, the third important criteria is really, you need to think about enabling autonomy. And um, again, when we think about the data mesh, it's all about enabling the business units and the business owners uh, with uh, capabilities so that they can actually do the necessary transformations to convert the analytics ready data to make it business ready. And to be able to enable those uh, users, um, you really need to kind of abstract the technical complexity so that they can more easily work with the technology without uh, requiring out of uh, technical skills. And then the fourth one is you have to think about how to build an ecosystem. Mm. And um, I will be talking more during the session about, you know, what are the things that, that will enable you through the semantic layer to create an ecosystem. But um, at the high level, it really becomes, you know, how you can have a central governance, but then uh, make those data pro products through the governance, with governance, searchable, discoverable, uh, so that the business units and the business owners users can easily search and find and reuse uh, the data products or the components of the data products to be able to create uh, their own semantic uh, models uh, and the data products to be able to uh, use it in the analytics consumption. So um, really like um, it's it's about you know creating how to create a um, ecosystem. So when we think about those uh, four important criterias um, to achieve the business ready data, um, there's a need to have, uh, you know, a semantic layer. So before I get into like how semantic layer uh, really enables the data mesh concept, I just want to kind of talk about the dinosaur in the room. Uh, so as you, uh, you know, you may be aware of already what's a semantic layer. Uh, obviously, it's not a, it's not a new concept. Uh, semantic layer has been you know, around maybe, um, you know, um, two decades. I think it has been first introduced with business objects. Um, and it's really like um, creating a semantic layer is, is creating a business representation of the data that help end users uh, to access data autonomously using common business term. Um, at a very high level, the way that I, 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 I refer to it is, if you want your data to talk the language of business, you need a, a semantic layer. Uh, so it really kind of mapped the complex data into familiar business terms. Um, and then, um, as I will be covering, um, it really enables the organizations or the create the data products where the data products become discoverable, trustable, um, and then, you know, composite like that can be, um, you know, uh, can, can put together like Lego builds, uh, Lego blo blocks um, to kind of really um, enable the different business units. So again, uh, like semantic layer, it's not a new term. I think it's the dinosaur in the room. Uh, but as we look at the, um, you know, the, the modern cloud uh, structures and also like thinking about the data mesh and how to enable data mesh, it's a must uh, to think about uh, semantic layer. Uh, so uh, why I'm, I keep saying that, you know, semantic layer uh, is really enabling the data mesh because um, I think so far in the presentation, I, I've repeated a couple of times that um, 
data mesh requires a central uh, data governance. So today what is happening is uh, if you don't have a semantic layer, you want to enable your uh, business units with the necessary data transformation and consumption. And then, then what is happening is, as those business users are um, touching their, or the, the, the touch point of the business users uh, to the data is, is uh, the business um, intelligence tools or the analytics tools. This is where all of the transformation of data is happening to make that analytics ready data uh, business ready. So again, um, the operational data maybe has been already transformed and then is being made uh, analytics ready. And then by using AI or um, BI tools, now the business users are having access uh, to those analytics ready data, but there is still tons of transformations that are happening. And the worst thing is all those transformations to make that analytics ready data business ready is happening at the edge in each BI or AI tool. Of course, Again, when you think about data mesh, uh, you don't want to lose the central governance, the single version of the truth um, while enabling the business owners, use, users. So that's why it is very important to, to think about the semantic layer. Uh, the advantage of using semantic layer, you know, although it provides the central governance, um, one place where you know, there's one definition of customer and, you know, the transformation logic um, to make data, you know, cons customer data. Um, there is also the benefit for the additional benefit for the data consumers, uh, because now, again, as I mentioned, all of the business units can have access to the, you know, single version of the truth. It is trust trusted. They can actually see the lineage of the data, understand what transformations has been data, where the data is coming from. The data becomes discoverable right away. And then more importantly, I see that, you know, a uh, semantic layer to achieve uh, data mesh and also to achieve the ultimate self-service. Um, when you have the semantic layer, you know, the, you can let the business users to really use their BI tool of choice to access uh, the single version of the truth to be able to do their analytics. And for me, um, again, I spent almost two decades in my career, like building and innovating self-service analytics. And I think one of the important thing when we think about self-service analytics is the, you know, the ultimate self-service analytics is we, we can actually let the business user to use their BI or AI tool of choice to consume that data. And that is what the semantic layer enables. So I think this was a kind of a good recap uh, of what's a data mesh What's the semantic layer and where I see the, the overlap um, between semantic layer and data mesh and how semantic layer really enables uh, the uh, business units. But again, there's like more things that I would like to cover uh, when it comes uh, to the capabilities of semantic layer. Um, there are fundamental things that uh, we really need to think about to achieve data mesh uh, success. So first of all, uh, semantic layer, it really manages the transla translation of analytics ready data to business ready. Um, and this is again, as I mentioned, uh, where you can really enable your uh, data to speak the language of your business. Um, the second thing is, you know, uh, if you are thinking about a semantic layer, uh, the, the platform should be really, um, you know, um, easy to use uh, where it can actually abstract the complexity of data and technology so that it really simplifies the creation of uh, new business ready views uh, with pre-built and composable uh, building blocks. Um, and then again, semantic layer um, should be the um, ultimate logical place where you can apply the governance policies uh, where you can put the guardrails on data usage and, and also ensure that there is compliance and uh, trust and consistency that is happening on the data. Um, so then we look kind of closer to the like um, more detailed capabilities that um, I advise you know uh, to the customers or the users that I talk to. Um, you know, what are the things that you need to think about when, if you if you want to apply a semantic layer approach uh, for uh, to enable data mesh? The first thing is uh, you need to really have um, a practical and agile approach for semantic modeling. So semantic modeling is where I see that, uh, you know, the application of the business logic and business context happens to uh, the analytics ready data. 
um, uh, this is where the data you know becomes uh, more um, you know my, more dimensional and and the semantic modeling uh, is really needs to enable uh, different modeling personas like uh, the persona doing the Semantic modeling could be a BI developer with a graphical user interface, or uh, semantic modeling can also be done via the via a markup language or a code-based approach, uh, so that you know data engineers or the analytics engineers can actually uh, create semantic uh, layer or semantic model at the end of the data pipeline, so that the data pipeline doesn't have to end with just a table, uh, data table, but it can actually end uh, creating a whole semantic model uh, where the user can actually create a, you know, a, a metric store and then define um, all of the dimensions and the breakdowns or the relationships uh, where uh, that set of metrics can be, can be analyzed in a governed manner. The final, the other thing that I would like to um, mention about the semantic modeling capabilities that you need to think about is, you know, the semantic model uh, should support the composability with confirmed dimensions. Um, I think this confirmed dimension concept is very important for data mesh. So let me first of all explain what I mean by the confirmed dimensions. Uh, confirmed dimensions are, are, you can think about them as the common way of analyzing data, uh, like common master data that exists in the organization, like things like uh, product, customer, uh, time, or warehouse, or store. Like those are the things that you would like to have a consistent way of analyzing uh, metrics. So those are, you know, what I'm referring as the confirmed dimensions and your semantic layer, uh, the platform should enable you to define those confirmed dimensions once, right? Because you want to have one definition of customer, one definition of product in your organization. But then once those confirmed dimensions or the master data has been defined, um, then it should become searchable, discoverable, uh, so that, you know, if a sales department, um, has already created a definition of customer uh, to analyze the metrics, then um, the, the uh, marketing department should be able to easily use the same confirmed dimensions to be able to have the same uh, type of answers uh, to achieve the single version of truth. So I really think that the confirmed dimensions um, are a, you know, the needed, uh, uh, the, 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 the stone to really achieve a uh, successful data mesh because I see the confirmed dimensions as the connected like are the connecting points to create that connected tissue of data mesh in an organization. The second area that I would like to highlight is the power of providing central governance uh, via the semantic layer. Um, lately, as I talk about governance, especially in the age of cloud analytics, modern cloud analytics, I. I actually encourage uh, the customers that I talk to always uh, think about, you know, not only data governance, but to go beyond the data governance and then start thinking about performance governance and also um, financial governance. Because as you as you all know, we now live in the age of um, cloud data, and it is very important to think about the uh, you know cost and the financial governance. Uh, recently, especially with the you know economic situation that we see this year. I really think that the CFOs are the new CEOs. <laughs> Congratulations to the CFOs. Um, it's very important uh, for the organizations to manage the cost um, of their data warehouse, cloud data warehouse. And this is where I think, you know, uh, a true semantic layer platform should enable you to provide the visibility and also actually help you to optimize um, the cloud data usage uh, so that actually you can start easily, uh, not only monitor, but uh, optimize the uh, cloud data consumption as well. Uh, the third area that I would like to um, highlight for the key capabilities of a semantic layer is to really the opportunity to create decentralized data products. Um, this is again, very important to think about um, user-driven design thinking to create the data products. This is all about enabling the, you know, the user um, with the right tool or the tool of choice to do the analytics. So um, if you're a financial analysis, you can, you know, you should be easily e use Excel um, to be able to, um, you know, analyze your data that is on the cloud uh, via the semantic layer, uh, but still, you know, have the same definition of metrics in a high performant way that you can analyze it. Um, or if you want to do more uh, dashboarding, then you can use, you know, your favorite dashboarding tool. Or if you're a data scientist, you should be able to use your choice uh, of ML tool uh, to be able to um, 
consume data and do ML modeling. So this is all about you know enabling the the right persona with the right uh, data uh, tool so that they can actually consume the data product um, to generate insights. All right, so um, I've been talking, you know, what is the semantic layer and the, the key capabilities that you should be thinking uh, if you consider a semantic platform to enable data mesh. I just want to kind of highlight, you know, where semantic layer sits. I think so far, uh, it has, you know, become obvious that, you know, semantic layer sits between the cloud data platforms um, and then the analytics uh, and then uh, AI tools. Uh, this is where I really think that the, you can enable the business units uh, where they can actually come to the semantic uh, layer where they can actually do, you know, with drag and drop with a nice, easy to use graphical user interface. They can define um, their uh, tables and the relationship between the tables. They can define and create a metric store, and then they can actually define um, confirm dimensions like that one definition of customer, one definition of product. And when I say definition of a customer or a product, I don't only mean like a business definition or a text. Um, what I mean more is like, you know, uh, a customer dimension may actually have four different um, data tables where, you know, this is a, a data steward can actually define what's the best way to relate those four tables so that uh, the user and all text consumers can have the right way of drilling down when they want to analyze their metric by customer. Uh, so, and then once the, you know, all those semantic layer uh, or the model definition has been done easily, then the user can define the metrics and the dimensions. And as you can see, like on the semantic layer, you can have a metric store, uh, but then those metrics and then those um, hierarchies and drill down paths, the same ones in a governed manner become available on the BI tool of choice. And this is where I'm referring as the ultimate SaaS service. And when you think about data mesh is all enabling to enable the business units. And I think this is very important to really enable the uh, analytics consumers where they can actually have access to the governed set of metrics and dimensions. Um, so th that could be different layers in a semantic platform. Um, I think for me, you know, there are four uh, important um, parts to think about semantic platform. The first one, which I've already covered, like semantic modeling. Like what are the things that you should be thinking if you are looking um, to have to do semantic modeling? As I mentioned, like providing multidimensionality, confirmed dimensions, being able to create those confirmed dimensions, but easily share them, become make them uh, searchable. The second thing that I would like to highlight is, you know, the semantic platform uh, should enable query virtualization. And this is very important as, um, when, when you think about data mesh, right, as it is all about enabling the business units and the business users, um, it is important for uh, the business users to really analyze the data with the power of the you know, cloud elasticity um, and then the uh, scalability. So this is where you know, to enable data mesh, uh, I don't think that you should replicate data uh, so that you can actually you know, empower your business users with data. You should really think about a technology where you can actually leave the data where it is, uh, especially I'm pretty sure there are many enterprises right now, they are going through their journey to move their on-prem data to cloud so that they can have the elasticity, right? So that is one of the goal. You don't want to, you know, replicate data um, and extract it from cloud environment and then put it in a tool. Um, this is where you really have to think about, you know, how you can leave the data in the cloud, uh, in that elastic data warehouse, cloud data warehouse. But then um, you need to have a semantic platform where it actually can provide all of the advantages that I just covered with flexibility, agility, multidimensional, speed of thought analytics. But but then by using uh, the query virtualization can actually optimize the consumption um, without caching or uh, replicating data. Um, I also covered like the importance of performance optimization and also um, cost optimization that you need to think about. So that's why like, as we kind of think about all of those needs uh, when it comes to um, looking for a semantic platform, I think there are two things that you need to think. The first one is really um, is, is you need to have a semantic layer. And this is more the traditional uh, you know, thinking for the semantic. 
you know, it's about the semantics of the data. Um, and this is all about having a passive metadata, uh, where you store the passive metadata. So definitions of the data, uh, who has access to data, where the data come from, because, you know, those are all of the important criteria to really, to be able to create a data product. But then the other important thing that you should be thinking about is having a semantic engine. And this is where I think, um, most of the organizations or technology providers are, are missing this piece. When I mean the semantic engine, this is where the platform, semantic platform, should be able to capture active metadata. Um, active metadata is the metadata about the analytics usage and consumption, uh, so that the platform should provide you, like, what's the data usage, what is the data popularity, what metrics and drill down paths are used together, um, and by using this information, you can really um, empower the data mesh practice in your organization because uh, this is how you can actually have the visibility and monitor what business units are creating, uh, what data products. Um, and again, this all comes about reusability of the data products, uh, but then also like optimizing the consumption of those data products where um, the semantic engine actually can create, can do uh, automated data engineering, engineering to be able to create the right data aggregates uh, in the cloud data uh, so that the consumption of the analytics and data products become much more faster. And through the semantic engine, uh, with the usage of active metadata, you can actually also achieve a lot of uh, cost savings on your cloud data consumption uh, because, um, you know, the semantic engine uh, is able to realize the query patterns, the most commonly asked business questions to create those um, automated aggregations on the data source uh, so that, you know, your overall consumption of cloud data doesn't have to be at, you know, granular level at the same uh, all the time, but it can actually start using aggregates data. Uh, so, <clears throat> I just want to kind of quickly kind of do a recap in terms of how the semantic platform fits into the modern uh, cloud analytics consumption, um, and then just tie it back finally uh, again to the data mesh concept. Um, as I mentioned, this is all about providing governance of service uh, analytics that can be both descriptive and predictive. Um, you need to think about a semantic engine uh, that leaves the data at the source, doesn't replicate the data, uh, but then, you know, it can become the natural gateway for all of the analytics and data product consumption. Um, and then just, you know, if you are making investment to cloud data because of uh, elasticity and scalability, you want to leave the data where it resides. And so that also the users, they can actually have a 360 degree view of all the data that's available in your cloud data platform. And they don't actually create their products, data products on a siloed data set. I think I have already kind of covered, you know, how you need to think also uh, governance in the age of cloud analytics. Um, although for when you talk about data mesh, um, you know, central governance and data governance is the, you know, core of, of the governance that we have to think for data mesh, for a successful data mesh. But you also have to think about performance governance and financial governance uh, in the age of uh, cloud analytics. So to kind of wrap up, um, I think, you know, if you really would like to achieve uh, data mesh um, through my experience working with customers, I think there are five things that I always suggest uh, if you want to kind of um, achieve a successful data mesh and what are the, you know, uh, main points that you have to think about. The first thing is really you need to define data domain and then have an alignment uh, with business domain for those data domain. And a good way of a good way or a, a good approach to achieve that, like again, you can look at your line of businesses that exist in the day, in, in your organization um, and then start aligning the data domains around them. The second thing is uh, you, you need to think about, you know, how we can put business context to the data domains. And again, um, as I mentioned, data mesh really uh, requires you to, to kind of do user-driven uh, thinking on the data product. And this is where you, you need to be able to have a flexible and agile way to reflect the business logic and business context to the data so that it can become business ready. And then once you have those data products, you need to be able to easily register those data products so that they actually become reusable, uh, discoverable, and searchable. Um, and that reuse is very important because this is where you can really, um, you know, really um, enable the central governance with the reuse uh, by achieving a federated um, ownership uh, that's been done by the business units. And that um, 
that reusable uh, data products, which I was referring as, you know, part of that is the confirmed dimensions, um, really they, they create the data mesh tissue because then you will be able to connect different data domains via the confirmed dimensions so that um, maybe the sales department um, has already a semantic model to answer questions uh, related to promotions. And then now your marketing department can actually do easily search, discover, uh, you know, the, the, the components of that data product and then like a Lego blocks, they can actually put them together with the you know support through the metadata, um, and then just create that connected tissue so that you know marketing data can be analyzed together with the sales data to create the uh, to provide a 360 degree view um, on the organization. And then the final thing uh, that I want to highlight, we have to think about central governance with a federated approach uh, where you can actually give the responsibility to business domains to kind of create those data products. I think uh, this is kind of like where I would like to um, wrap it up in terms of, you know, what was the data mesh? What is the need? Uh, what we have learned over the last two decades, you know, doing different approaches to make data analytics ready. And then, you know, where we have been failing because we haven't really put in enough attention on the last mile of data transformation, where the data should become business ready for the analytics consumption. And this is where I see the application of the data product thinking comes in place. So um, just, I want to briefly kind of mention, you know, uh, you know, who is at scale and what we do. Uh, um, as I've been kind of talking about the value of semantic layer, um, at scale is the leading semantic layer platform. Um, and really what it does is it enables a metric layer um, um, supporting different analytics use cases that can be uh, augmented analytics or BI consumption or AI consumption. Uh, but the important thing about you know, semantic layer and our platform is we really uh, leave the data at the data source, at the cloud data source. Uh, we don't do extract or we don't do caching. And um, as I highlighted, you know, it is all about having a semantic engine where it can actually optimize the consumption of those uh, data products, uh, where it becomes actually, you know, speed of thought with the performance optimization. But then while ensuring that, you know, with the automated data engineering, uh, the semantic engine can actually create aggregates at the data source uh, so that the cost overall uh, data cloud consumption costs can, uh, can actually decrease by time. So this is kind of like a, you know, our, what are we are very proud of, like we have many enterprises today uh, using at scale as their semantic platform. And then I've been, you know, working in the last couple of months a lot with all of those customers to really help them with their data mesh strategy and how they can really empower their business units with a governance set of metrics um, that's been powered by at scale. So if you would like to see at scale and uh, in action, uh, you can go and visit our website. We have a lot of demos. And then also I've been writing a lot of blog posts about data mesh practice um, and also just overall how to create uh, data products. There's very good um, um, data practices that are available at our resources. So with that, I want to open the, the, uh, the time for Q&A. Shannon. Thank you so much for this amazing presentation. So many great questions coming in here. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder to everybody, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. So diving in here, um, Alif, in, in a BI scenario and not necessarily big data, does the semantic model require the enterprise or organization to have the data warehouse with a star schema or snowflake schema on? Or will flat tables with no star or no snowflake data model schema work? Yeah, it can work. That is the, you know, the one of the advantage of using a semantic platform where you can actually convert the tabular data uh, to a, you know, multidimensional where you can on the fly um, you know, on the graphical user interface, you can define a customer and what fields, what drill down should happen when you want to analyze the metric by customer. Um, and then the system generates the right SQL logic or whatever the dialogue to the backend requires. So yeah, um, the, the, the short answer, that is the advantage of having a semantic platform where you can actually make already like that star schema and then define additional uh, transformation on that star schema to make it business ready, or you can have a tabular data, you know, you can still define the business logic, and then importantly, you know, provide multi-dimensional analysis on that tabular data. 
Right, so uh, it seems like the vocabulary management is missing. Is that something? Uh, no, yeah, that, that's a great question. So I'm assuming that the question when they say vocabulary management, it is like how you define the business terms on data. And this is where exactly the semantic layer, you know, this is, you know, by using that graphical user interface, you can actually define uh, the business definitions and business term on the data fields. Uh, this is where you are actually um, defining or making analytics data business ready is what I've been referring. Like when I say making um, analytics ready data business ready is, you know, there are different activities that you conduct. Like one of them is, defining the business terminology on the data. The other thing is you can actually create new transformations uh, in a agile and flexible way uh, by using the semantic layer uh, without requiring you, you know, writing how to write you know, SQL or complex different scripting language. Uh, so those are the things that you can you know, do easily do on the semantic layer to really enable data mesh and then make the data business ready. Is the semantic layer a single unified tool or a set of tools that work together to provide all this functionality? Uh, it's usually like a single tool um, that where you can actually uh, do the semantics of the data. Uh, but I think you know you have to think about uh, semantic platform or the layer as part of your whole data fa fabric strategy. Um, that is one of the things that I've been highlighting at the beginning of the call, right? When it comes to the definition of data mesh versus data fabric, uh, data fabric is the utilization of multiple technologies uh, in combination to enable a metadata driven implementation and augmented orchestration design. And a data mesh is a solution architecture that can guide the design uh, with, with the technology agnostic framework. So coming back to the question, uh, this is where I see, you know, semantic platform is part of that multiple technologies that really enables the, you know, a metadata driven implementation of data fabric. And then, you know, data mesh is really an organizational framework and practice to achieve, you know, with the use of te technology. So it is part of the, you know, multiple technologies. So um, data mesh and data fabric are different. Are they different concepts or also different technologies and how they're implemented? And can a semantic layer be uh, the technology for both? <laughs> I think I just was answering that question, Shannon, but that, that's again a great question. And uh, it's just great to see those things. Again, just to repeat, like uh, data mesh and data fabric are not the same concepts. Uh, um, a data fabric is the utilization of multiple technologies um, in combination to enable a metadata driven implementation um, and different orchestr orchestration techniques to really kind of create that connected tissue via the technology. So the data fabric is, you know, is all about the application of the data where those technologies can share the metadata to create that connected tissue of data mesh. And data mesh is actually, again, as I, as I mentioned, it's an organizational practice um, to really um, help the business units to create their uh, data products. Uh, so when it comes to semantic layer, semantic layer a platform is part of the technology, right? And, and when you think about the whole uh, data supply chain, it starts from raw data to make it analytics ready. And you have a set of uh, technologies that you use like DBT, Airflow um, and others. Um, and then to make the, Analytics ready data, business ready. This is where I see the semantic platform technologies to be it needs to be used. Um, but then, really, to augment uh, the business ready data, there are other technologies like data catalogs, analytics catalogs uh, that you can use so that you can make the data products more searchable, more discoverable. Um, again, uh, it's all about kind of like thinking about the metadata um, and then how you can create the connected tissue. Um, of data by using those metadata. And then semantic metadata is an important part of that. Thank you. So where do I store such a semantic layer? Uh, sorry, Shana, could you repeat the question? Sure. Where do I store such a semantic layer? So um, one of the important things that you have to think if you want to consider semantic uh, layer, that you know the semantic layer shouldn't require data storage. Um, again, when you think about, you know, we, are, we live in the, we live in the age of cloud data, um, and then 
elastic um, data platforms in the cloud. Um, you know, and many enterprises are moving their data to cloud to provide that elasticity and scalability and performance. Uh, so that's why it's very important if you are considering to have a semantic platform where you can actually, you know, apply the business logic, make data more business ready. Um, you really have to think, you know, look at the technologies where there is no caching, no replication of data or no data movement. Um, the system that's where I, I've been talking about, you know, ask about semantic engine um, because the semantic engine uh, should be able to really uh, answer the questions that are coming from multiple BI tools, should have the unique capability to convert the right dialect to back to SQL and then run those queries on the data source. Uh, it's very important. Like I really like, if there are a couple of things that you are taking out from this uh, sem seminar, I, I just want to kind of really highlight that, you know, if you are looking to be successful with data mesh, yes, data mesh is all about creating data products for your uh, where your business units can achieve that. But that shouldn't mean that you have to replicate data to have data products that are available to business units. If you have a strategy to move the data to cloud, you know, there's a reason why you have started to that journey. So look for the technologies, semantic layer technologies, where it can leave the, it should leave the data at the data source and then, you know, have a unique semantic engine um, to enable uh, business ready data without moving data. And there's so many questions coming in. Any questions we don't have time to get to, I will be sure and get over to, uh, to you uh, afterwards. So, but Continuing on here, any tools out there that could, um, uh, well, let me actually move on to this. So do you have an example of a completed semantic layer that you can show? Uh, I don't have it, but if, again, uh, if you, you know, if the audience can go at scale.com, there are a great set of uh, demos where, you know, you can really see how easy to create a semantic layer on top of your cloud data and then have your business units create data products, uh, make the data business ready, um, and then to make it available to be consumed with the, any BI tool or BI tool of choice. Um, yeah, so unfortunately, I haven't planned any demo on this uh, session. No worries. So, um, and you know, if, you know, for in terms of data governance, are there any tools that fit into the architecture and the context of data mesh? Do traditional tools like you know any data catalogs or stuff like yeah. that work well? Yeah, yeah. I highly suggest. Again, that is a great conversation that I'm having with our customers as well. Is a again, it's all about using multiple technologies. Uh, data catalogs is where you can actually have. Um, you know, more uh, business definitions on the data. They can provide more uh, visibility on the data lineage. Uh, and the way that I see, you know, semantic metadata is part of that whole overall uh, metadata um, fabric that the organizations has. So definitely, I, I think there are uh, additional technologies that you can consider uh, data catalog. And in fact, many of our customers, they have a data catalog product um, and we have an integration to uh, of the semantic layer to data catalogs so that we can actually um, reflect the metadata of the semantic models to the catalog. Uh, so yeah, I definitely uh, you know, um, encourage organizations to look at those technologies as well. There's All actually right, one question, uh, Shannon, sure. that I can see, like what's the difference between semantic layer and headless BI? Um, that's a great question. <laughs> um, in fact, I think, you know, um, we have to think about what's the difference between semantic layer, headless BI, and metric store. I think those are all terms that, you know, define the same thing. Uh, it's all about having a layer uh, that sits between the analytics consumption or ML consumption and the cloud data warehouses. This is where, you know, having that layer where you define, you know, a common definition of uh, metrics and dimensions and all the business transformation. So semantic layer, headless BI, metric store, they're all the same concepts. Um, and, you know, I think headless BI, we have started seeing it more and more when, when it comes to embedded analytics or process automation. Um, again, you know, our, our semantic layer has APIs and this is where I refer to as a semantic platform where, you know, it's not only about human analytics consumption, you know, we are all going through a digital transformation. There is more automated processes. So all of those processes should be able to have access to the semantic platform or the headless BI uh, to use those, you know, business ready data for the processes as well. 
Yeah, very nice. And uh, just one more architectural question here. I think we've got time to slip it in. Does your uh, semantic layer in at scale need to be relational or do you support graph semantic layers in knowledge engineering? Uh, that's a great question. So uh, it doesn't like um, the way that we, we have done it. Uh, it's actually we have a graph within our technology stack. Uh, this is how we are able to understand the query patterns uh, in an organization. Um, like. For me, the use of graph is important for active metadata because active metadata is all about understanding the analytics usage patterns in an organization. Um, and from that perspective, like its scale semantic platform has a unique graph um, database that we use on the back end with out of IP on it. Uh, this is how we are able to optimize the analytics consumption. So again, you know, part of the semantic platform, yeah, yeah, graph is important for active metadata, but then, you know, the tabular or relational structure is also important for the passive metadata. This is all about how the data relates to each other. Well, Alice, this has been a fantastic webinar. Thank you so much. But I'm afraid that is all the time we have scheduled for today. Again, just a reminder to everybody, I will be sending a follow-up email by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. And again, I'll get all your unanswered questions uh, over to at scale. Uh, so those can be viewed as well. I love, thank you so much. Thank you at scale for sponsoring today's webinar. And thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged. Much appreciated. Hope you all have a great day. Thank you very much, Shannon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all.